Should we do it? Let's do it. All right. 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 Hi, everybody. My name is Jennifer Martelli. I'm just so happy to be here tonight. I'm up in the control. This is the first time I've ever been cold in the room. So this is nice. But what makes you really special um, are the readers to me. They, they form the nucleus of my writing community. Um, they're good friends, great writers, but just really good people. They laugh with them. Trust them, their, their books are uh, taking places, and teaching things. And that's me. So, we're, we're three great readers from the North Shore. We have a big North Shore uh, Thursday poet. We have a show here tonight, so that's wonderful. And we're going to start right off with Colleen Michaels. Mm -hmm. Colleen Michaels is the author of Cosmo, which came out in 2023. Editor of Salem Power, owns the 2014 Improbable Places Poetry Tour, which came out this week. Also, and co author, along with Kevin Carey, of the chapbook, chapbook 2023. And I think it's up there. Uh, is it up there yeah, at the register? Sure. Yay! <laughs> They'll sign them for you. Her poems, <laughs> her poems have been commissioned as installations. For Festival, the PBS Museum, the trustees of Nations. Hi, Betty. She <laughs> directs the writing studio, studio at Monster Art College of Art in Beverly, Massachusetts, where she began the Improbable Places Poetry Tour, bringing poetry to unlikely places like tattoo, pa pa uh, tattoo parlors, laundromats, and swimming pools. Yes, in the swimming pool. And Colleen, you have a call for a, for an improbable, for games? Games. Games. So if you have any poems about games, playing games, send them to Colleen. Personally, I love the places Colleen Michaels' poetry takes me. Her poems invite me into a world of sweet, fatty foods, mm -hmm. illusions, games of chance. They are tactile and, and generous and offer me a place in a world often flavored with fear, uncertainty, hurt, but mainly love. In conflict resolution through soup, Michaels writes, my soup shifts shape in the cauldron. My soup turns battles into cook-offs, whisking aggression into bisques and soft broths. My mouth liked reading that out loud. It just felt good to read that. I love the humanity Michael's brews when she describes a humble gathering at the top of the pot, caves of flavor, sweet or pungent, of our own making. The poems in Michael's debut collection especially render love with all the pain and missteps of parenting. Whether at Paragon Park, where we stayed through two packs of cigarettes, four rides, one carousel, are at home as in reversible dress and apology. We are warned that ease is just a fabrication based on cutting lines. Michael's work remains delicious, honest, and prayerful, and the poems taste sweeter than cannoli. Colleen Michaels. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. The problem with having Jen Martelli introduce you is you're like, damn, you made me sound better than I am. So, but thank you. And thanks to the girl here. This is really, I'll tell you a little bit later why this is so special to me. But um, I knew that I'd be standing in this corner because I've been here before. And uh, and so I wanted to start with um, some poems that are just in praise of reading. And this is from uh, my first collection, uh, Prize Wheel. So, uh, so I'll be reading a few from that and a few from uh, a book I wrote with Kevin. Getting and Spending on Commercial Street. At the Provincetown Library's book sale, our daughter decides to part with her dollar. There is so much that she could get with it here on Commercial Street. Rubber ducks in buckets on stoops rainbow beads and unicorn stickers 
all manner of sugar blotting grease. Since morning, this dollar has been gaining value in her right front pocket, the bill now bullion, heavy as fudge weighted with walnuts. It picks up the wet palm momentum that money always gets, a duty-free frenzy, a sailor on leave. We steer her away from ships trapped in plastic bottles, talk her down from the flip-flops that do not fit. We go to the library, right there in the middle of the street, close to the head shop and the lobster pot. She heads for the basement, the annual book sale. Downstairs, it's strong smelling and cool like Noxima on shoulders after a full day of sun. Her fingers, small crabs at low tide, walk the spines of the books. So, and then um, I decided I have a companion piece to that, since you're already in the basement with books. Um, <laughs> this one's called Unmentionables. This is a prose poem. I don't know if that matters. You're not going to know. <laughs> but I know, because I can see it. Um, unmentionables. <laughs> Even though her grandmother could thread needles in the dark, the girl would have to read the circular specials to her. So she'd read for fun while eating butter and sugar sandwiches at the kitchen table. If the other grandchildren were over, she'd tuck the paper away. They were already bullies at school, like their fathers had been, like her father had been. The basement was off limits, but the girl had gotten down there had seen the old washing machine and next to it, her grandmother's winter clothesline hung with the stiff, cold shapes of her family. Clipped onto the line were pages ripped from books, the A pages from the dictionary, a child's spelling book, newspaper clippings of coupons she wanted. The small girl started to take on small chores dusting the collection of depression white glass. I'll let the L lag on my tongue and cut it with the sour K sound, milk. I'll hiss the end of glass, she'd whisper while snaking the figurines along the windowsill, slow winter work. In the spring, they were ready to take the laundry outside I'll hold the clothespin bag until your basket of cold tangles is sorted out. Piecing together the words her grandmother still needed, they filled the line, a sheet for a sentence, a dish towel for vowels. We will use unmentionables for silent E. So it's kind of like a secret. So I, I snuck in an, an underwear poem in, <laughs> into the Grolier and uh, I'm kind of proud of myself. And um, I'm kind of proud of myself too, because um, when I was a teenager, I worked at the garage right here selling Doc Martens and spandex. And on my break, I would come and skulk around here. And my first book I bought was um, Nikki Giovanni's Cotton Candy on a Rainy Day. And um, yeah, so I, I have, so it's, it's um, so thank you. Thank you for making this place and thank you for inviting me here. Um, it's, a, it's a big deal for me. Um, so uh, I thought I would read, um, we were talking a little bit about writing about art and I, I have the pleasure, the distinct pleasure of working at an art college on the North Shore Montserrat College of Art where I have the best gig. I get to sit with artists and talk to them about how they might write about their work. So I get to see a lot of art. And um, so we do a lot of acrostic writing. And um, this one came about a trip some of us took together to go to um, Peabody um, Historical Museum and look at some of the objects. Um, and so while I'm this is uh, after the painting, um, A Woman Ironing by Edward Degas. Uh, we were actually holding um, irons. So actual you know, irons, like you're dying your pants. Okay. Um, American Laundress responds to Degas. You've left them to believe how I must quarrel and drink, bleaching my toil and blushing my cheek, 
leaving the impression that I've sat for you. That look is not a coquettish glance. I'm cataloging the weight of work, taking inventory of my tools. The flat iron, its Vulcan name dressed in filigree on the stand is hidden, always hidden, an indulgent, indulgence buried at day's end. The sad iron is the heaviest. Its handle becomes that of crutches, warmed wood stained through with palm oil and pressure. The ruffle crimper, a dance hall name, good for a direct shot into a pleat, is the iron shaped like a bullet. And uh, I'm gonna switch, change the mood a bit. Um, so another distinct pleasure in my life is that I got to write with Kevin Carey. And so during the pandemic, um, we it was we were coming out of the pandemic and we were, I was kind of stalled out and we we're like, hey, Kevin said, hey, let's have a project. So we picked a project. And I, I bet you were going to explain this better because you were going to go first. So, yeah. so he'll fill you in on anything I've left left up. But basically, we um, imagined uh, Greek gods and goddesses uh, living in a gated community, basically being jerk faces. Um, so we would assign one to each other. And um, thank you to Eileen Cleary. It became a chapbook out of um, Lily Poetry Review. So we're really excited and happy to have it out in the world. So I'm going to read a few from it. Um, I'm not going to read Kevin's. You might read, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But um, so I'm going to read a few of those. So the first one is um, Hera shops at Whole Foods to feel alive. Oh. That's the, yes, that is the response you should. Um, contemplating the self-serve soap bar, she dreams of a clean kill. Here, you are allowed to cut your own. So she portions herself a sliver, lemon verbena, sometimes charcoal and tobacco, cruelty-free promises. She pockets the sickle moon, struts peacock style to the dairy and non-dairy aisle where with one side eye, she besets a constellation of allergies from nut milks to new mothers. It is no coincidence that Echo in the Bunnyman is in heavy rotation on her shopping days, humming about fate <laughs> and killing. Her nail pierces the flesh of a pomegranate and then an apple. She returns the produce cut side down to bleed or bruise, then scrawls on a comment card, pod fruit, do better. When the, uh, when the cashier asks prime member, she hears prime number and responds, yes, don't dare put me in a line with the others. <laughs> um, another one is... <laughs> Aries, god of violence, shops for new clothes. He has a hole, but not the inclination to mend himself. There is a seamstress, let's call her Hope, who works part-time at a department store at the Mall of America. So he brings her a suit, wants to show off. Look how I burst at the seams. She holds the pins in her mouth, again deals with a man and his arms, knowing that even on her knees at the hem of violence, she is working to shape a better silhouette. It takes some doing. Aries is enormous. Violence is not so difficult from fast fashion. We hate it and we buy it. Poor hope who's on the way out, drafts patterns to fit what we openly wear or choose to conceal. Our bodies expect a poor fit. It's no surprise that Aries never picked up the altered suit. Who has the patience, the time? He lost the claim ticket. He'll claim it was not his loss. Ask him about his wardrobe of armor. He'll tell you he gave up on fixing the hole tried to grab anything off the rack to cover himself, but it was easier, way more fun to buy another gun. So that's a heavy one. Um, they're not all chuckles, um, but a lot of them are. And they were really, really fun to write because 
I um I don't want to say I'm an you know like I'm a kind person, but I, I I try to be you know, um but I got to be so mean in some of these, and it was really fun to like take on these personas of you know people with a lot of privilege acting really really badly, and um I have to look around because there's a lot of people from the North Shore, but none of my neighbors are here, <laughs> so oh I don't know who's on that. All right, we're gonna take well. So this one was really, really fun to write. Um, my neighbor, my nemesis, a lesser god, but still fun to write. Um, my neighbor, my nemesis, my new shovel you borrowed rusts on your porch. It's April. Indignation makes a gully between our property as I pray the slant in your direction. How can you not own your own sump pump? I bought a lace leaf house plant, a raw tongue and pointing finger, a comfort. I gooseneck to catch you stooping to scoop shit. I want you to see me seeing you bend low. I mean, we go to we go to parties together. We're fine, but it was fun to imagine that kind of anger. So, um, so I will. Um, I want to. How am I doing on time? I don't know. Are you doing okay? <laughs> so I thought I'd read something new. So I'm working on some some new material. I have I have books for sale, and that's super excited. But I'm super also excited for the stuff that you you cannot have yet because it is not created. Um, but I started thinking about um, this idea many many years ago. Um, backstory. My my father, really, really interesting guy, um, was a counterfeiter. So I've been writing a lot about money and jail and lies and storytelling and embellishment. He also became obsessed with putting glitter on things like jewels, gluing jewels onto stuff. So that's what I'm working on now. And it's it's weird and I haven't figured it out. Um, and my, my parents are both dead now, but um, I feel like if they could have made it here, um, you know, like they would, they, they know this place. They, they knew, you know, what I was, what I was like at, you know, 17, 18. And they probably would have gotten their car towed because they would, would have parked illegally yeah. to come to it. So they probably wouldn't have made it. But um, <laughs> like, I think they, I don't know if they'd say good job, kid, but I wrote my own poem that says good job kid for me so 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 yeah I'm like asking for love tonight right like, so so uh this is called inheritance it's brand new um my grandfather was good with money a saver a bond man he worked in a factory hamming rip hammering rivets into blue jeans he built the pockets to hold other men's wallets he had a Christmas club account, a ledger, and a pearl vinyl case with Kennedy half dollars. It snapped closed like that scene in Pretty Woman where Julia Roberts becomes high class so quickly just by laughing in a red dress. Mm -hmm. I love to count things, lining oranges on a windowsill, marrying the earrings my grandmother clipped to her lobes. The silver dollars grew in value. Don't lose the money. My mother would shout whenever we tried to play store with the coins. See how the ridges are silver, like small pleats? Rare. They are sending you and your sister to college. We were told Kennedy was special. We were told what we had was worth something. First one, Kennedy died, then another. Later, my father, and then my mother. The pearl case now yellowed from cigarette smoke, outlived the people we put our trust in, and the fictions grew full on. College turned out to be free or borrowed, a token in a family with little left. The case's contents swell like a story at an Irish wake. I wanted to jangle all the pieces in my pocket, even if I knew they could never be the big ticket we had made them out to be wanted to take them to Rodeo Drive on a vindictive shopping spree, wanted a montage payoff scene to show how things can grow when treated well. 
When I take them to the appraiser to calculate my worth, he adds the silver half dollars at face value. What more could he do? Only a family can value something so imbued. I took what was owed to me, 150 bucks, and grabbed the only thing that made sense. A pair of gold painted hands, strange curtain tiebacks from anthropology. Whenever you are in my dining room, you can't help but notice my inheritance, a bright articulation holding court around the table. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Colleen. That was wonderful. Kevin Carey is coordinator of creative writing at Salem State University. Books include The 115 to Penn Station, The Beach People, Jesus Was a Homeboy, which was an honor book for the Patterson Literary Prize, and Set in Stone. His poems have appeared on the Writer's Almanac on National Public Radio three times and on the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day. Kevin is also a playwright and a filmmaker. He has co-directed and co-produced two documentaries about poets, All That Lies Between Us and Unbearing Malcolm Miller. A crime novel, Murder in the Mosh from Dark Stroke Books was released in October, 2020. A new novel, Junior Miles and the Junk Man, dropped in 2020, September of 2023 from Fitzroy Books, Regal House Publishing, and a co-written collection with Colleen Michaels, Olympus, Height, Olympus Heights from Lily Poetry Review came out in October. He is the co-founder, along with M.P. Carver, of Molecule, a tiny lit mag, and you can find out more about Kevin at kevincarrywriter.com. That's a lot. <laughs> so how do I talk about the clarity and the beauty of emotion in Kevin's poems? We both grew up on the ocean in Revere, a small gritty beach city just north of Boston. On a very personal level, I know these poems. I could have, I may have been in the poem Revere Beach After Hours, <laughs> standing at Kelly's Roast Beef as the speaker is about to take my order at three in the morning. They all start dancing, long hair, tight pants, hips moving to the disco beat, boogie, oogie, oogie, and a plane flies low overhead on its way to East Boston, and the sway gets louder, and the laughter, and the sidewalk moves with the motion and the madness, and for a moment, I stop what I'm doing, stand with my hip hands on my hips, look at the bobbing heads, the hungry mouths, the dark ocean across the street. Kevin is a poet of place and of memory or of places where memory is as immediate as imagination and is real. His poems speak to the part of us that is afraid of what we remember and what may be in store for us, yet they encompass so much of life, family, basketball, good movies, in the last party, he writes, my daughter was sad losing her last grandparent. I remember taking her to visit in the nursing home a few weeks before and saying, if I have to go to a place like this, please just push me in front of a bus. She nodded okay, but not next week, I said. I haven't finished watching Fargo yet. Kevin Carey. <laughs> Got my phone in there. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks, James, Jen. Great to read with two of my pals here. Um, it's just fun to be in Cambridge on a cold night, and you all came out. So uh, thank you so much. Pauline already introduced this book a little bit, so I'm just going to read a couple for a minute.
Hephaestus is a strange myth. He was born uh, out of Hera and out of jealousy and without her being impregnated. And she was jealous because Zeus had given birth to Athena out of his head. And then he got tossed to earth and became lame and ugly. And uh, let me just read it. Hephaestus remembers the war lobbyists. They ask me, Hephaestus, what do you want? Golf junkets, Caribbean cruises, young girls from Serbia? I keep them in the shields, pour gold for the righteous fights. They all want one like Achilles, story on the sleeve. The children of my street chant, hey, Smithy, you're so ugly. But that won't stop me from dropping my seed, hammering myself into every God-fueled battle. I ain't no looker, but all the big shots come to me because they know I pound the anvil day and night. Keep the machine rolling. Was the ticket and blings the thing. Chant all you want, pretty little ones. Who do you think made Achilles a star? Sword, shields, breastplates. You want them? I got them. Even a golden chair for the right lady. Strings attached. <laughs> we had fun with this. Went back to school on our myths. Um, I just want to find one more for you. Where is it? Dionysus throws a wine tasting. <clears throat> Dionysus throws a wine tasting. Tables, cover, tables covered in silk cloth, crystal goblets around the moist mounds of grapes, a string quartet by the fire pit, everyone nodding appreciation like an obedient vine cult. It gets a bit blurry after that. Some goblets smashing, wine dripping off my chin, someone's ass in my hand. The three daughters of Minyas groping in a pile by the pool. The Amazon queens chanting, he's so divine with all his wine. <laughs> Neighbors pawing each other, me yelling, the cheese floating in a cabernet, the one-eyed dote yelling, chug it, and Hera <laughs> raising her glass. Your grandma's not around to put you back together. Something sharp in my hand, some screams, wine flowing to the patio and blood, a thunder crack maybe, then the morning light and I'm draped over a lounge chair, a few bodies by the pool barely moving, a broken violin in my feet, my head, the size of a medicine ball and Stephilius standing over me. Dad, you've got to stop drinking. <laughs> <clears throat> So that was a blast to do, just to kind of revisit a lot of uh, things I should have read in school and didn't. <laughs> I had an I had a new novel out in September. I'm not going to read from it, but this is it. <laughs> <laughs> Junior Miles and the Junk Man. So I've been doing a lot of readings in schools, and the book, among other things, is about overcoming obstacles, right? So. I've been starting these readings off in the schools with this poem that I wrote about the own my own obstacles that I had to overcome. It's called Getting It Right. It's from Jesus Was a Homeboy. In grammar school, I stuttered, felt the hot panic on my face when my turn to read crept up the row. Even when I counted the paragraphs to memorize the passage, I'd trip on the first of the second word, and then it would be over. The awful hesitation, the word clinging to the lining of my throat, rising only too late to avoid the laughter around me. I was never the smartest kid in the room, but I had answers I knew were right, yet was afraid to say them. Years later, it all came out, flowing sentences I practiced over and over, Shakespeare or Frost, my own tall tales in low-lit bar rooms, scribbled in black-bound journals, rehearsing, anticipating my time, my turn, a way of finally getting it right. So it was fun to read that to the kids and just be vulnerable, right? And just yes. say it's okay, right? So, and it ties into a lot of what the novel is about. I'm gonna read you some new ones. 
nervous. No, this is a <laughs> this is a manuscript that's floating around out there. So if you see it and want to publish it, let me know. <laughs> this is called the party at the end of the world. At the party at the end of the world, there will be cream filled Bismarcks and goat cheese <laughs> and cold bear and hot dogs with sweet relish. People will sing ballads and strum tinny guitars and toss each other into the lake for kicks. There'll be campfires everywhere, and those who always hated one another might learn to shake hands, even if they don't mean it. And the MC of the party, a guy who predicted the end long before, will tell us how lucky we are to be together for such a festive occasion. Even if it's a story we take to the grave, not one we can tell our grandkids on some rainy afternoon by the shore. And the closer it gets to the end, the more the regrets will start spilling out. The should-haves, the could-haves, the whys and the why-nots. And folks will end up crying in their beer like a Sunday night at the Blue Star under the spell of a Hank Williams song. And someone will say something they don't really mean and a chair might break and a punch might get thrown. And before you know it, the party will turn into an old Western saloon brawl and we'll end up going out the way we came in, kicking and screaming into the light. I was in Key West when Charles Simp died, and I wrote this poem. Key West for Charles Simp. Like seeing myself and not recognizing me. Maybe dressed for a disco reunion or with long blonde hair on ball that. You reminded me for many years of the tenuous nature of perception, what we see really not becoming what we've seen. I walked to Val Street after hearing of your death, the late afternoon sun fading like a dusty orange curtain, someone playing a guitar, singing in Spanish a crowded pier at the end of the world, skunkweed wafting, people in pelicans and clusters, the echoes of a rooster down some hidden alleyway, the brush of palm leaves, the din of a tiny island plane flying toward the horizon. The poem I forgot to write. The poem I forgot to write is in my back pocket, scribbled on a matchbook or a bar napkin or etched into the wall of a bathroom stall. The poem I forgot to write comes clean, tells the truth, doesn't disguise itself in shrewd language, shoots straight. The poem I forgot to write has never been written by a guy like me, a scared little poet in a tired body. The poem I forgot to write sings with joy and redemption, lets itself off the hook, doesn't try too hard to be light. The poem I forgot to write is waiting for a chance, for a break, for a road sign that reads, entering nowhere you've never been. Mm -hmm. And... I'll read two more. This is a black, it's called the Blackout Poem. It has an epigraph from Sean Thomas Stone, to be found alone on a strange street. I know this place, the Sunday morning cold from my feet to my brain, shaking out a hazy memory like a dusty blanket, the wheels of each passing car turning out of sight. We know you, we know you. For sure they'll judge me someday, even if I can't remember for what. So I stand convicted, shivering in ripped jeans and a stolen t-shirt, thinking I should go home, thinking I can't go home. Slowly giving way to the sinking swamp of empty-bellied regret, a stranger on this lonely street that only yesterday was my jam. Hmm. Now I'll end with this <clears throat> a fable. 
a long, long time ago, a very bad wolf, probably the worst wolf ever, did some very bad things to some lambs. Some of the worst things ever done to lambs anyway. As a matter of fact, this very bad wolf had wanted to eliminate all the lambs. The lambs who were saved from elimination made a pact with some very big bears who helped save them from them. And together, they decided to push some rabbits from their nest so the lambs could have a land to call their own. It's worth noting that these rabbits had nothing to do with the very bad deeds of the very bad wolf. So the lambs took a mile, but then they wanted two, and then three, and so on and so on. The rabbits who were being pushed from their nest fought back and were called very bad rabbits. The lambs who wanted even more land made even more big bear puddings, and this gave them even more power, which they used to keep pushing more rabbits from their nest. The rabbits had no bear friends, so they fought back again, and they were called very, very bad rabbits. And so the story goes, but this story has no end. The lambs are still pushing the rabbits from their nest. And soon they will have eliminated all the rabbits. And when that happens, the lambs will have done what the very bad wolf had wanted to do to them. The moral of the story, a rabbit with no big bear friends is easy to push from a nest. Thank you. Musical chairs. I know. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kevin. January Gill O'Neill is an associate professor at Salem State University and the author of Glitter Road, February 2024, Rewilding, Misery Islands, and Underlife, all published by Kevin Carey Press. From 2012 to 2018, she served as the executive director of the Massachusetts Poetry Festival. Her poems and articles have appeared in New York Times Magazine, the Academy of American Poets Poem A Day series, American Poetry Review, Poetry, and Sierra Magazine, among others. Her poem at the rededication of the Emmett Till Memorial was a co-winner of the 2022 Allen Ginsberg Poetry Award from the Poetry Center at Passaic County Community College. The recipient of fellowships from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, Cave Canem, and the Barbara Deming Memorial Fund, O'Neill was the 2019-2020 John and Renee Grisham Writer in Residence at the University of Mississippi, Oxford. She currently serves as the 2022-2024 board chair of the Association of Writers and Writing Programs, AWP. I remember reading Jan's previous, not this book, the one right before it, previous book, Rewilding, and coming upon her poem, Sober, where she writes how easy it is to get caught up in destruction and how hard it is to rebuild, like scaffolding coiled in the greenest ivy as the process of rewilding begins. The first image that came to my mind was the Japanese art form of mending shattered bowls with gold lacquer. Kitsuji loosely translates to golden journey. Something new is created by these precious seams, something stronger because of its shattered nature. This is how I characterize January's poetry, as well as her practice as a literary citizen, the golden journey, the bringing together of experiences and pieces and people and words. There's a through line through January's books from a marriage coming apart to recreating a family with their children, strong enough to confront the horror the ongoing and unanswered for horror of racism, murder, and the legacy of Emmett Till, where my heart curves around the side of this road, reconciling that old hurt with an old, with an old resolve. We honor, we grieve, let our feet sink into the mud where the brown water rages. The meandering journey of the Mississippi in her book, Glitter Road, is flowered with magnolias created by her daughter, Ella. 
we, the readers, are invited into this discovery, this joy, this love, this family, where it's hard not to feel good riding a glistening wave, the road ahead made beautiful by this temporary shine, January. Thanks, Jen. And thanks to James and uh, all the folks at the Grohl Year. And thank you all for coming out tonight. It's such a pleasure to read with Kevin and Colleen. So this is just awesome. More shores in the house. <laughs> so uh, this is Glitter Road. It came out this month. It's the last day of the month, but it came out this month. And I will never stop shaking the cover because it's so pretty. <laughs> um, so it's just an honor to read here. And um you know, and to read with my buddies. So, so much of this book was written um, uh, when I was in Mississippi as the Grisham Fellow. So uh, 2019, 2020, we were there for an academic year and then, well, we were there for seven months and then COVID hit and then we were there for another two and then came back here. Um, but we had a good opportunity to explore the area, not just be tourists, but more travelers so um much of this book um uh, takes place in mississippi the river remembers here the water is silt brown stretches mile wide flat as a washed out conveyor belt an unhemmed rumble strip i can't read the river can't see my hand when it plunges elbow deep to feel the cool against the Mississippi heat, hot as a dog's mouth. Here we canoe for hours through swirling eddies, watch the trash barges and towboats travel downstream. The river glistens hard as broken glass. Here, everything is fluid. In lower Mississippi, the south, south, where the two-lane blacktop cuts through an infinity of flat, cotton, soybean, corn, farm, farm, tumble-down shack. Creeks and rivers bifurcate the land like blood veins. Here, the GPS gives up. New islands form at the current's whim, and what is untouched grows lush and verdant. Willow and privet border the collapsing coastline. A carp leaps into the boat when it hears us coming. We stop here at an oxbow. Gumbo mud sticks to our feet. River rock, plastic, fossils, gar. Raccoon and coyote leave tracks in the rust-colored sand. The slaves, sold down the river, hid here waited for their chance to escape up north, hid in caves, fled to the Twin Cities and Canada, their fate at the mercy of the river's next rise. Here's the nadir of our suffering, which started in one place to end in another. Here's where flow and marvel and history converge, this harm joy, this beautiful sadness. on the edge of a field in Sumner, Mississippi. I pick cotton with my bare hands in the town where Emmett Till's killers were acquitted in 1955 at the bottomlands fed by the swollen Tallahatchie. History of the last empire explained in its white dreamy boils. Cash crop so valuable that plantation owners burned it by the bale to keep it out of union hands. And I can't help but think about the Negro hands, cracked and worn, twisting the lock from the burr, stripping the stalk from top to bottom, the hard ground broken against weather and weevils, their lives tied to a parcel of land, children younger than my own, working from can to can't see, under a blistering sun, 
hungry, half paid, or nothing. The debts they would die with. Everything weighed down to the fiber. Everything done by hand. I break off a branch to feel trauma in my hands. A reminder that I have risked so little to be here, not even the shirt off my back. Um, let's see. So uh, one of the things that Oxford, Mississippi is known for is um, uh, Faulkner, William Faulkner. And uh, his property is maintained, he has a big estate there, and it's maintained by the university. So one night they had a function on property. So this poem is called Rowan Oak and it starts with the epigraph. The past is never dead. It's not even past. William Faulkner from Requiem for a Nun. Under beaded lights strung from cedar to cedar, we dine on low country oysters, briny and delicate, salty flesh floating in large shells, shucked and sucked. Roasted sweet potatoes and spinach salad on the side of this communal meal, celebrating labor. The cooks, the servers, the growers, the wild harvest. How the fondness of a place triggers nostalgia and melancholy. On this night, we tread on southern soil at Roanoke, the grand estate where Faulkner wrote about postbellum Mississippi. We sit near his mammy's quarters. Like history, it is in plain view. Eighty years before Faulkner, the enslaved who lived and labored here built the university that now owns this space, a constant reminder that the past is never past. We drink wine, listen to laughter all night, which sounds like indifference. The remaining oysters are stirred into a stew, the kind of dish we made for ourselves, adding what remained to heavy cream, the grace of salt and pepper. Praise every complicated bite. Each spoonful becomes a memorial, a reckoning. And so walking around Mississippi uh, and Oxford in particular, you know, there's history everywhere in Oxford. Um, uh, I think the university was a hospital for the Civil War. And so, you know, there's a lot that the university is reconciling with, but there's also a lot of beauty and um, a lot of natural space there. Elation. In the city's center is an unwalled forest, a dense plot of cedars so thick their canopy keeps light from reaching the ground. We gaze at the stretched out stalks, etiolation, you say, pointing skyward. But all I hear is elation. It's the elongation of stems, the branches growing up, not out, their long trunks turned white, from too much light. Tolerant trees, they claim this space as their own, making the most of what's given them. Their back and forth sway moves us. We listen to spindly trees creaking, rocking chairs on a wooden porch, the sound of a cello's drawn breath, the clatter of branches like the chatter between old coupled voices when no one is around. So one of the nice parts about, one of the best parts about Mississippi is that my boyfriend lives there and we met while we were down there. So we've been dating long distance. And so he's at an event tonight. Otherwise I think he'd be on the line. This is for him. The Great Hello. A big ass moon rises full and wide in the Western sky. The deep pond awakens with the tongues of bullfrogs. I'm barely over the threshold before our mouths lock and we slither onto the bed. We watch each other, watching each other with a silent urging, a kindness for the other in pursuit of pleasure. 
I fling my head back as he grabs my hips, pulls me close, begin to feel myself levitate, hovering above the bed as the shadow of someone I don't recognize but have known all her life. I am an over easy egg trying not to break her yoke, but I do. The joy of leaving the body tender and shivering. A moment of gratitude for every daunting thing that brought me to this place where I am my most fearless, my most true. I wick the sweat from his head, slide my hand across his glistening skin before crawling back into myself, sprawled across the sheets, streaked in moonlight. And I will close with these two. Um, so one of the cool parts about the Grisham Fellowship is that I got to stay in John Grisham's house, which you won't find on a Google map because you can do that when you're John Grisham. Uh, but the university owns the property. The university owns the property. So there are very few of us uh, Grisham winners who can say this, but I can say this. I slept in John Grisham's bed, <laughs> a bed on stilts, queen size, with a well in the center I'd always roll into, white pilled sheets, threadbare and thinning. I worked hard to earn that bed and the room surrounding it, meaning I must have written words once that meant something. Big wide windows look onto a cluster of magnolias that never lose their leaves. No blinds, I like to let the light in. I imagine John Grisham plotting out a bestseller, legal pad in hand, kids like mine bouncing on a mattress high enough to touch the ceiling fan. This bed I have shared with many authors and lovers who also wrote words that meant something. They slept here, loved here too, on this bed that scoots away from the wooden headboard from too much movement. Can't help but laugh at the bedroom door that does not lock, sliding a chair in front of it for privacy, or the attic we were afraid to enter, the creak of the floorboards above our heads. And when I think my big thoughts about the world, time travel, or black holes, or God, or death, I come to the bed's blank page against the shimmer of sky glow. And so, I'm kind of waiting for one of those magical movie moments when you start reading a poem about your daughter and she walks in the door, but that might not happen. So my daughter's coming tonight. And as Jen mentioned, uh, one of the cool things that uh, about this book that I love, maybe my favorite part, is that we have these magnolias as section breaks and mini section breaks. And my daughter, Ella, designed them. She's now a student at Mass Art, but uh, she was high school then. So I love, that's my favorite part of the book. And she's coming tonight, but she might meet us a little later. So this is for my Ella. For Ella. I love a wild daffodil, the one that grows where she's planted, along a wooden highway left to its own abandon, but not abandoned. Her big yellow head leaning toward or away from the sun, not excluded, but exclusive. Her trumpet heralds no one, not even the, Can the Canada geese, their long-necked honks announcing their journey to somewhere else. She'll be here less than a season, grace us with green slender stems strong enough to withstand rain and spring's early chill. And when she goes, what remains, she'll, she'll bury deep inside the bulb of her, Take a part of me with her until she returns. How lucky am I to love this bloom? Thank you. And I guess since so since we're swapping seats, I won't make you get up again. So <laughs> thank you for coming tonight. We all have books for sale, and Roller has many, many books. So talk. <laughs> we'll be around. You know, thank you again to the girl here and thanks for coming out. Have a good night.
Thank you. 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 Thank you.